We had talked about creating a CERC webinar series, and uh, uh, it is my very, uh, well, it's my extreme pleasure to introduce you today to uh, Professor Baba Kadari of Stevens Institute of Technology. He is going to talk to us uh, about a need for a new design perspective for socio-technical systems, and can complex networks uh, perspective be a viable candidate? Uh, very briefly, uh, Dr. Hidari's background, as I mentioned, he is an assistant professor at the School of Systems and Enterprises at Stevens Institute of Technology and the director of the Complex Evolving Networked Systems Lab. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, with a minor in management and economics, and he's got three years of industry experience in Silicon Valley. Uh, in addition, he's just got a diverse set of research interests and a very strong academic background. His uh, research interests are in developing model-driven approaches in analysis, design, and governance of complex network systems, uh, and in network resource sharing formation and diffusion of collective behaviors, modularity, emergence, and the evolution of those behaviors, and the co-evolution of the structures and behaviors in complex networks. Uh, so he's been funded by many organizations, including the National Science Foundation, DARPA, International Council on Systems Engineering, and the Systems Engineering Research Center, and also a number of private corporations. And he is also a very recent 2016 recipient of the National Science Foundation uh, Career Award. So again, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Hederi. And uh, Babak, I turn the floor over to you, please. Um, hi, just let me test and see whether you can hear me. You are coming in very loud and clear. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is my uh, pleasure and uh, extreme honor to be the first uh, speaker in this wonderful series. I see um, many interesting uh, talks and wonderful speakers that will um, continue this, this uh, initiative in the rest of the year. And I uh, am looking forward to uh, all of those. Just before I get started, um, okay. Um, so before I get started, um, just a uh, quick couple of quick notes. One is, um, so this is not only the first webinar in this series, it's also the first webinar that I'm doing, that I've done ever. So it's, uh, I expect that um, there, are some, there will be some, some coordination problems as you probably this one. Uh, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, also, uh, can I ask everyone to, um, uh, phone or their audio on mute. Thank you. Um, also, uh, I have more material um, on this slide for, for than, than I can present in one hour talk. I uh, want it to be comp as compre comprehensive as possible on the slides, um, and, but I will skip some of, skip some of the details and um, uh, we'll leave them all be available to answer any question that's, that's um, if someone is interested to know more in any of, about any of these topics. So um, I also wanted to say that uh, a good part of the material that you were going to see uh, is the work of my wonderful, wonderful students um, and lab members, uh, either the kind ones that you see the pictures of or uh, the alumni of the group, um, uh, one postdoc that I had who is now a, uh, the lead data, of, the, of data science at, um, in Facebook New York, and one of my and, um, uh, students that just graduated in um, December, uh, Dave Gennetto, and uh, Bobby C. the um, uh, pictures of my other PhD students. So the context of the, and now I go to slide five, um, the context of the talk is social technical systems. So, um, just as a kind of like a reminder slide, this is um, um, there's nothing new on this slide. Just wanted to uh, provide a context about 
uh, various um, um, high-level trends that are happening in many different um, different systems. Um, so, uh, social technical systems are going from more like like centralized to are connected to a lot more decentralized. They go from more controlled uh, uh, way where the behavior of every part and every key uh, component is controlled to more autonomous um, um, scheme where um, agents or different components or different subsystems uh, decide on their own depending on uh, the situation they operate in. Um, and also, Another trend is to uh, going from more homogeneous um, uh, systems to more heterogeneous systems, where uh, systems or subsystems of very of uh, uh, very different natures are uh, connected to each other and need to coordinate and work together um, as as a complex systems. And basically, um, those those subbullets are. Um, uh, main reasons why these uh, trends are, are happening, for example, going from um, control to more autonomous is mainly driven by um, uh, the need to, to deal with more um, increased um, uh, uncertainty in, um, in many of these systems where uh, rather than embedding all the mechanisms to deal with the um, anticipated situations in the environment, uh, we, we prefer to enable um, um, this, the various systems components to decide on their own when they face a new uh, environment or a new situation. Um, so um, all these, these three trends are basically the same trends that also drive the complexity of the system. So, to um, um, my take on complexity is basically um, nothing but the combination of these um, three trends in, 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 in most systems. Now, going to slide six. Um, so, we have these complex um, social technical systems, and the goal is to get um, the desired behavior um, um, uh, from these systems. So, what are our options? So, basically, we have an, um, a, like three um, uh, three options. One is um, continue thinking the way as engineers have uh, have have done so for for many years, if not uh, many centuries. It's basically like through the lens of control. So hierarchical design, making sure that all the parts and all these uh, subsystems behave the way that we want them to behave. Um, so this is this is kind of like a control um, and and control theory um, and classical um, and either optimization on one hand or or classical control theory on the other hand help us a lot to to achieve this 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 goal. But um, this is not sufficient for social technical systems, or at least like like for for um, many aspects of social technical systems, because we are dealing. We, um, as we just said, um, that there is a considerable level of autonomy in these systems, either by uh, the autonomy of of, of the um, technology agents that are present, or um, um, the aut autonomy of human being who interacts in kind of like a bi-directional way with these systems. So, now one might say that when we have um, um, uh, a group of autonomous uh, autonomous units or agents, uh, then we can uh, uh, put our hat, uh, the uh, economist hat, and say, okay, so like as the economists say, it's all about incentives. So why don't we just like provide them uh, like sufficient incentives to various agents that are uh, present in, in, in these systems? So turns out that this is this is this is actually something that we need to start importing to our field. So a lot of time, um, make, there are many problems where we need to start thinking about incentives rather than pure control. But 
um, this is not sufficient uh, for, for social technical systems because we deal with certain um, um, characteristics and certain, um, like, like the design of system, the architecture system or some design aspects that don't fit in in um, the traditional uh, economics uh, perspective that is all about incentives. So that brings us to the third way, which is um, um, looking at uh, the design of interaction and communication structure. And that's where the lens of network architecture comes into play. Um, so it's a, um, uh, the goal is uh, there uh, to um, design the structure of, of interaction in the network in such a way that over time we get the desired behavior that we want in, um, in, our, uh, in our system. So, and that's where, that's the, that's the um, topic that we want to discuss today. So, now moving to slide um, seven. Um, so, just, um, I'm, I'm sure um, uh, most of you have heard something about complex network theory. Um, networks are basically um, nothing by, but the combination of um, some, some nodes and some links, um, as you can see. Um, but it turns out that uh, we can uh, model these nodes and links in, at different levels of complexity. So if we uh, ha uh, consider spectrum of complexity for the nodes in um, social technical systems. We have like um, we can be we can have very simple nodes, basically just a junction. So um, nodes could in a network could just be a junction of of links, um, uh, technically like like a, a, a geometric node. Uh, they can be uh, more sophisticated. Um, they can be like decision-making agents, where the nodes represent represent agents who can 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 um, um, act in an environment and and decide. Uh, or we can make them uh, even more complex by making them decision-making and also adaptive, so through learning or through some other um, some mechanisms of uh, adaptation we can have uh, decision-making um, and we can have adaptive agents. And also, on the other direction, um, um, we can also have di different um, complexity levels for links. So if we have link complexity as the um, second dimension, uh, we can uh, think of links as, as simple as possible, very simple as binary links, they either exist or they don't exist. So that's the simplest way that we can, we can look at links. Um, we can make them a little bit more complex uh, by, by also considering the intensity of, of the links. Now, uh, um, we can make them um, uh, even more complex by uh, considering the, um, uh, uh, them as uh, strategic interaction between between agents, um, and we can uh, go for uh, even higher level of complexity where we not only bring in the strategic interaction of agents, but also peer to peer uh, learning, um, or uh, that's what something that's called social learning, um, in, uh, into the picture. And um, so, how do we do this? Uh, the, uh, for for the simplest case, the uh, you node know, just as a uh, as a junction and a binary link, uh, our tool is, uh, is is the good old graph theory that has been around for for a long time. It's a mature um, um, discipline, mature, like a rich theory. Um, if you if you want to go for higher level of complexity. Uh, then we need to combine graph theory with game theory because that's where we can can model decision making behavior of 
agents and their strategic interaction. And if you want to go for the ultimate level of complexity in this, in this at least in, at least in this framework, um, we combine graph theory with this time uh, evolutionary game theory that 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 brings the evolving nature of agents, and also some theories of learning. Some of them have been developed in in artificial intelligence, for example, reinforcement learning, or or um, social learning in general. Um, so um, now now we'll go to slide eight. Um, Network science has been around for uh, uh, for um, has been a an active area of research uh, for at least uh, 15 to 16 years now, and uh, networks of very different natures have been have been modeled and studied so far. So um, just here, I'm, I'm showing some some examples. So. Um, and as you see, the context is very diverse. Um, uh, there are studies that are focused on protein-protein interaction, uh, power grid network, um, the uh, polarization in the in the um, uh, political uh, domain by the, the lower corner um, uh, that shows the. Uh, block sphere interaction in, during the 2004 um, uh, U.S. election, and also the um, context of finance, where uh, we look at interbank, um, um, that, um, that, that the picture shows some interbank trading network in uh, Syria. Um, so, uh, this slide nine. Um, so these are all great visualizations, very nice studies, but um, what do we learn from this? Why do we even, why are we interested in this? So uh, beyond just a specific um, study, uh, I, um, um, I think we learned three um, uh, major things from, from, from networks, and are like, like basically these are the three ways that network science uh, can be useful for us. So one. Um, uh, the first thing, the first takeaway is that um, networks of very different different natures, as different as protein protein interaction to and and interbank trading um, uh, networks, have some interesting similar structural attributes in, in, in common. So um, there are, and specifically, there are three um, uh, key structural attributes in common. One is the small world phenomena, um, the, 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 the good old six degrees of separation, which is not even six degrees anymore these days. Uh, I just checked um, um, last night my average degree of separation on Facebook. So, like, pick any random person in the over a 1.5 billion members in Facebook, and uh, I'm, I'm connected to. Um, that random person who can be anywhere in the world by on average 3.28 degrees of separation. So there's a link there that you can you can check your average degree of separation. Um, so small world phenomena is one key a aspect. Um, high transitivity um, net, net, um, real networks are most most of them are. Have high transitivity, which is basically um, the, the intuition is that your uh, uh, your friend's friend is also is, is also your friend. So there are a lot, many many triangles in the, in in, um, in real networks. And the the last one is the power law uh, degree distribution, the so-called scale free or um, near scale free uh, network that uh, and. Um, um, became famous in, in the um, in the in the last decade. So that's the first takeaway. Uh, and um, the other second takeaway is um, um, knowing the fact that networks um, are very good tools to link micro or local level phenomena to macro level. Um, macro level behavior. So this this has been that this this question of how to link micro to
to macro in complex systems, that is something that networks can naturally deal with. For example, the local preferential attachment mechanism can resolve a scale-free network, or the local triadic closure mechanism can resolve a high transitivity in, in, in networks. And the third, um, the third aspect is um, and the fact that networks naturally um, link structure and behavior. Um, so especially, especially when we consider nodes not just as junctions, but as agents with, with, with decisions and, and behaviors. So these are, these are three um, takeaways from network science, and these are the things that will be useful also in, in, uh, when we in, uh, engineer um, socio-technical systems. Um, slide 10, <clears throat> so just uh, three, um, um, three sum summary takeaways, just like put them for um, 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 just at, uh, as, as a summary of our introduction up to this point. Um, the um, most important part is that although network science has been studied uh, extensively in the last um, 15 years or so, um, there is a huge gap between uh, network science and, and um, um, engineering aspects of, of, of uh, uh, network the, 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 like, that we need for social technical systems. That is not only uh, applying some of the findings in network science, but also we need to um, push the boundary of, of state of the art of research in network science in order to be able to use some of the um, um, some of the good aspects of, of this this um, new lens in engineering social technical systems. So <clears throat> let's go and let's discuss about a an, an example in a little bit more depth, and that's slide 11. Um, so and let's look at the um, um, network of decisions. So here uh, we have um, many decisions that we need to take for uh, for a, um, a particular system, the nodes represent the uh, decisions and the links represent the dependency of the nodes. Um, um, the, um, most of the systems engineers are more familiar with the other representation, uh, the DSM matrix of, of the, depend the decision dependency. Um, so, um, but um, how do we how do we deal with these interdependent interdependent decisions? Because if there are like separate nodes, uh, um, we we have enough tools to to deal with them. But once once they become interdependent, um, so one uh, line of literature uh, that has been around for uh, 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 for a couple of decades is theory of modularity, standard interfaces. Uh, people like uh, Carlos Baldwin from uh, Harvard Business School uh, has contributed substantially to um, um, to this domain. Um, and well, there are many. So we um, understand how we, we you know, given a um, particular DSM matrix, for example, um, where are the best point place to to put the standard interfaces and introduce modularity to deal with interdependence. Uh, decisions, uh, but we can also think more explicitly about who uh, makes these decisions. So um, uh, the obvious answer is people. So we have um, various teams uh, who work on, who are responsible for any of these uh, decisions, and uh, there, through that dependency, we have it also a network of interaction among uh, uh, people. But also, more increasingly, we have, uh, as we just, just discussed, we have uh, decision-making autonomous agents. Uh, many example, we have many examples, um, um, self-driving uh, cars or autonomous vehicles. Um, 
disaster response robots, uh, algorithms trading um, um, software, autonomous form and energy management technology, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the network of decision makers is something more similar to last picture where um, uh, you, there's a, there's a network of decision makers, um, a, a hybrid network of decision makers. So going to slide 12, um, we, can, uh, we can consider, depending on the context, we can consider a network where the nodes are either decisions or decision makers. Um, um, and and um, in most aspects, in most cases, we start with a two-mode network where um, uh, on the top we have decisions, one, two, three, four, and then decision makers and there are methods that we can collapse a two-mode network to a single-mode network and infer the interaction among decision-making um, decision units. Um, um, so, and specifically we talk about um, two types of decisions, either design decisions or uh, uh, resource allocation decisions, uh, that is more, the first one is more uh, during the time of design, the second one is happens real time during the, the operation of, of, the, um, of the system. Um, so, uh, one key question, so um, do we like these, these uh, interactions uh, and um, interdependencies? Um, in many cases, we don't. Uh, because these interdependencies uh, mean that it needs a lot of coordination, it means a lot of iterative processes result in considerable cost, and we, um, the, the system might uh, be prone to instability and, and scalability issue. So going to slide 13, uh, at the same time, despite all these um, problems that these interdependencies might create for us, um, they also can translate into value. So something that I learned during my um, um, during my project when I was a PhD student in, at, at Berkeley, where where we're designing uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, fun and we wanted to push the, uh, the performance of these systems. So so we immediately realized that traditional way of uh, go, uh, designing these, these um, uh, wireless uh, circuits by uh, uh, designing standard interfaces like the 50 ohm um, input and output and then matching between different units, that, that, didn't, that didn't work. So we, instead we had to co-design the, uh, the whole system altogether that basically resulted in the first set of silicon um, 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 circuits um, up, that worked above 100 gigahertz. So this was this was present announced in 2007. Um, so um, so these interdependencies actually like create uh, create room for customized design, but they also allow for dynamic resource allocation because you have uh, various either surplus or short of resources at different points in the system, so um, in, in, in which case you, uh, you benefit from, from these interactions. So let's do a little bit of modeling after all with, with this. So with all these benefits and, and, and costs, things that we like and we don't like about, um, about these interdependencies, let's consider a um, 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 let's just consider that a link, an, an interaction link between two nodes in the network has both a, um, a, an associated cost and associated benefit, um, um, and the cost and benefit are context dependent, but assume that we, we encapsulate all the cost and benefit into these two parameters. Um, um, the, but, and here comes a, a, a key point back because um, in most of the interaction, um, um, in, in, for most of these interdependencies, we only pay some um, um, direct cost, but when it comes to benefit, we, all, we, we receive benefit from 
direct connections, but also receive benefit from indirect connections. For example, here, node I is supposed to know the context of information. Node I pays the cost for uh, connecting to node J, uh, but it uh, receives benefits from um, uh, also nodes K1 and neighbors of node J forth at a lower lower rate. Um, so what are the what are the um, um, uh, in, uh, what's the need of using direct benefits? So for the case uh, of design, uh, the, the co-design. So if, uh, if you are again going back to do the example of, of the front and uh, uh, receiver, uh, if you are in charge of designing the LNA, the low noise amplifier, uh, and if you talk to the, the, the designer of the mixer, if you, you coordinate, but if you need it, you can, you can coordinate through the designer of the mixer with also the designer of the local oscillator, for example, who um, uh, you don't directly connect to, so you can co go for, for a co-optimization or co-design. But also, as I just mentioned, for resource allocation, uh, dynamic resource allocation, whether it's energy, information, or bandwidth, it, it's important. And also in the social and organizational context, um, there are some uh, classical examples of how people uh, find uh, out about opportunities, job opportunities, for example, through their friends or friends and, uh, rather than their direct direct connections to classical grant of it or uh, paper and that started the social network theory back in 1973. Um, so um, slide 15 now, um, and of course we can extend this to, to higher order uh, indirect benefits, so not only the, the friends of friends or the connections of the connections, but also higher order connections. So, um, which basically brings us to to a high order uh, to to a set of benefits benefit functions. So B then uh, uh, B, B in in general, it's the it's the benefit that uh, one one node in the network receives from uh, higher order distance. Uh, uh, or, so from from one to the maximum possible distance in in the network. And um, so if we assume that we, count, we have all these benefit functions and cost functions, we can, we can, count, we can add them up for each for we can, we can add them up and, and get the combined, um, um, the net uh, effect by looking at the uh, utility or of uh, utility value of each, um, um, each node, which is a function of the structure of the graph that G there, and so each for a given graph, every node in the network receives a uh, particular um, 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 utility, and if we add them all together, we get the overall utility or the collective the collective uh, utility of, of the system as a whole. So this model was first presented by economists uh, Jackson and Walensky in 1996. It's already a classical, uh, classic paper in, in, in economics, um, and, and engineers have not yet started looking at it. So um, one reason is um, uh, some, some, some unrealistic assumption to these models. So if you go to slide 16, so want to, what are the, so once we have this model, what problem we are trying to solve? So uh, one problem is, is basically like the, the more like science question as economists have mostly been looking at. So if you allow these agents to pick and choose their, their agents so that their own utility gets maximized, what kind of network we'll get? Um, and there's, there's a notion of stability that determines whether uh, everyone is happy with, with, with the current um, structure of the network. The second question is um, the engineering question, where uh, basically the question is, if you are a centralized designer, who should you connect to whom so that you, you get the maximum possible total utility in, in the network? 
and that's basically like finding the the the, 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 the topology G G G hat to that maximizes the overall the the aggregate utility of of the system. And the third question is the governance question, where basically you want your system to be simultaneously stable and efficient, meaning that that if you allow people to to decide, if you allow agents to decide a structure, the resulting structure uh, is something that is also efficient or is as efficient as, as possible. And um, um, this can be can be also achieved by um, uh, designing the and tweaking the cost and benefit parameters so that the the angle between this stability and efficiency gets minimized. So going to slide 17, uh, this, quest, this, this, this problem was uh, first solved by uh, Jackson and Walensky in, there in the same paper for the case of efficient, for the case of efficient network with lots of simplifying assumptions. So they assume that there are like end nodes, they have uh, uh, and benefit functions and cost functions, but in general model, everything is is, is, is homogeneous. So they are, they are um, the costs are the same for everyone, benefits are the same for everyone, and they show they and they mathematically prove that uh, the network or very low value of cost efficient network, the, the, the most efficient network is when you connect everyone to everyone, where which is like the, the complete graph for the high levels of cost, very high level of cost, it's basically never efficient, so it's, uh, nodes will uh, leave them isolated, they don't benefit from, from. And for intermediate level of, of cost, depending on the parameters of that cost and benefit parameters, um, the, it's the star solution, which is very familiar to, 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 to in, in applications, is the most efficient, um, efficient structure. Um, one um, interesting point here is that, as you see, like uh, the, the conditions for for the cost, as you start increasing when when you have a high level of cost, um, as you start increasing the number of nodes, at some point there's going to be a phase transition because the um, uh, the uh, term on the right side of the inequality gets bigger as you increase the number of nodes. At some point. C gets the cost level gets lower than the, the that the term gets bigger than the cost level, and then all of a sudden, from an isolated node, we get to a fully connected to to a, to a connected node in the, with its star shape. So, um, is this useful for for engineering applications? No, because um, this is this, this homogeneity assumption is, is very limiting. So, which are like probably we don't have any um, a homogeneous, a perfectly homogeneous. Setup. So it's a good, good, good framework, good start. So we took this framework and um, wanted to take this to a higher level of heterogeneity. We assume that the cost and the first order benefits are are heterogeneous. Um, we specifically included the heterogeneity that is the result of having different levels of resources. So if you have if you have a lot of, for example, bandwidth or a lot of time, the cost per connection is lower for 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 you than another agent who has low level of of, of uh, resources. So, well, for to each node, we uh, we we assign a different um, specific cost value and. Um, um, and going to slide 19 now, we analyze this, 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 uh, we solve this, this uh, problem for the case of uh, efficiency in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an analytical way. So we have a couple of propositions that are, uh, are in the paper that's noted on, under the slide. So the result is, um, given the conditions, the efficient network presents a an interesting uh, uh, co core periphery sh structure where you have a set of group of uh, a subgroup of nodes that are all connected to each other, and another the, the rest of the nodes are 
and not connected to each other, but all only connected to uh, um, all or some of these uh, nodes at the core. Um, um, and the, the, if we go to, um, uh, by the way, this was we this is this is published in uh, the Journal of Economic Letters, which is has got uh, kind of a confirmation of the point that I was er trying to make earlier that some of the problems uh, that we face do not not only require importing some of the knowledge from from other fields, but also in some cases we need to contribute to 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 those fields. In this case. Um, the, the field of economic networks. So if we go to slide 20 um, um, and look more closely to at core periphery structures. Um, so if we look, if we go for the simplest possible case, the same thing, a special case of the framework that we just presented. Um, to suppose we have two types of nodes. Um, one, uh, some of them are are um, endowed with big levels of resources, and some of them are like. Um, so we have they have cost C low and C high, and given certain conditions for C low and C high, we get a perfect uh, core periphery structure where the core are all connected to each other and the peripheries are connected to all the nodes at the core, and uh, which um, um, is um, uh, a special case of the near core periphery structure that is is, is the general case of. Um, of this this problem setup. So, um, do we do, do we actually observe these core periphery structures in reality? Um, yes. So, there are several recent empirical evidences that um, show that these core periphery structures are actually even better um, or a better representation of most real networks. Uh, uh, than, than the previous like scale-free network that was dominant in the last decade. So uh, uh, three very recent examples um, by by uh, Baldwin, Formick, and uh, Rosnack. They um, um, in the um, in their 2014 paper they analyzed uh, over 1,200 software and found that close to 92 percent of um, uh, their source code. Are, and interdependencies are either uh, core periphery or near core periphery structures. Um, um, there's also a study on, on interbank markets where it sh showed that um, um, they also present a core periphery structure with 25% of the of the banks at the core. Uh, very rec another recent paper that showed that world, the world airline network also presents a core periphery structures. So. If these structures are so useful, and if we have if we have um, um, and, um, and 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 common, uh, then we need to uh, from, from from the design perspective um, and using this 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 um, uh, uh, analytical framework that that we, uh, we just uh, saw, we can answer to first of all how many nodes are supposed to be at the core and how. The, um, how peripheries are supposed to be connected to the core. So, and and this the simple simple model. Of course, there's um, a lot of simplification going on there, um, but still, it's 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 um, it's realistic for many applications. Can 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 help us respond to those two uh, questions. Um, so we extended um, just. Um, uh, we extended this even further for, uh, this is slide 21 now, for the case uh, where um, we have different clusters of, of agents where uh, they have, uh, again, the connection model with cost and benefit, but the assumption there is uh, we have a, a low uh, interconnection um, uh, cost when for for inside the cluster connections and for across the cluster connections, or in this case we call it like inter inter island connection, we have a higher level and additional. Cost. Hello. We're back. Okay, so I thought it was sorry. So someone it was someone else. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, okay. Um, so um, uh, just to go into slide.
slide 22, I'm skipping some, uh, I'm leaving some, some details for, for just slides for, for your reference, but on slide 22, we uh, realized that depending on that inter-island, that the inter-island additional cost factor, you can get a range of interesting structure when you, if you want to optimize the uh, system for efficiency if you, or if you want to design the efficient structure. So one, one example, again, is the extension of the core periphery structure structure in the middle on slide 22 that we call a parallel hyperstar structure, where two core periphery structures are connected by having parallel links between, among, among the cores. That's, that's, that's also a structure that, is, that um, um, can, can help us with designing some um, 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 uh, efficient so uh, when we want to design efficient social technical system. So uh, slide 23. Um, um, so again, still this this had this was this was this had uh, up to this point we had some homogeneity assumption. Uh, uh, we want to go for the maximum level of homogeneity to make things more realistic. The um, uh, the problem there is once we add an arbitrary level of efficiency, we can no longer solve the model analytically. So we need to go for for a um, uh, we need to go for a, a, a computational solution. So we get the um, uh, for for this for this general case, uh, one interesting result that we observed was the efficient structure uh, tends to become become modular. So when uh, the, and we have a a, a, um, a the narrative of the story in, in our paper listed below, but the, uh, the assumption is once once you uh, have three parameters, the heterogeneity know, uh, uh, level of, of, of nodes, the connection cost matrix, and also assume the bound of rationality of, of the nodes, uh, the, you you're, you tend to go towards more modular uh, modular structures, which basically is where uh, network theory meets modularity theory to this level. So, like, if you just remember the uh, uh, the way to uh, deal with uh, interdependent decision um, uh, the networks. So, modularity theory was was one. This net network is another, but they also uh, um, uh, here with uh, uh, with this with this observation. So, um, up to this point, when you know, the focus was was on on structure, I have included uh, several slides for um, the case of uh, for uh, a different case on slide 24, where we want to look at the impact of network structure on more uh, complex behavior of decision-making agents. So, uh, um, and going back to our initial original diagram, so we want to look at that, that orange circle at the highest level of complexity of, 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 um, of our networks. So, uh, we, and there uh, we have um, uh, done uh, several studies to, um, to look at the impact of structure, network structure, on, on um, behavior such as um, cooperation, competition, uh, um, trust, fairness, and, um, um, and um, a similar group level behavior for social technical systems. Um, um, so, uh, as engineers, um, uh, we might think that these belong to the world of social sciences, but uh, um, um, this, this, this is this is this is not necessarily the case because um, some of these, some of these, uh, as we know, for example, from Prisoner's Dilemma uh, example, a lot of these behaviors can can result in. Um, um, and uh, lowering the level of uh, the, the lowering performance, overall performance, or in the case of uh, hybrid um, um, hybrid systems, 
where human and autonomous agents interact with each other, um, the perception of pro-social behavior is very important for human agents to engage in some sort of interaction. So in a way, we, if we design our, our, our autonomous agents to go for the maximum level of, of rationality or uh, rationality in the quotation mark, they might result in some systemic failure because they might not appear to be fair or cooperative by human agents who are engaging in their intra in the interaction with these with these agents. So um, I'll just um, um, show some 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 um, um, high level results uh, for for some of the cases. Basically, slide 25. We have designed a um, a multi-layer computational framework that uh, uh, that connects the uh, uh, the pairwise interaction of agents to the to the to the high level uh, uh, group level behavior by combining combining networks with evolutionary game theory with social learning and with with uh, some interesting um, and um, uh, statistical methods to to uh, track, keep track of the causality of, 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 of these cases. So we looked at, uh, so going to slide 27 now, we looked at the impact of, of um, structure on, um, on cooperation in, 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 in these um, networks where we showed that the community structure or network modularity actually helps with increasing the level of, of, of uh, cooperation in these networks. And uh, further down, I have more examples for the case of fairness where on slides 28 and 29, um, uh, different uh, nodes uh, participate in a uh, pairwise so-called ultimatum game where uh, one side proposes a particular, a, some, 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 um, um, that the first party proposes uh, um, some, some um, money in, in this uh, case. So like, like, let's say a share of, a share of uh, $1 or $100 that uh, uh, he wants to give to, to the responder and the responder can either accept or reject and, they, and if she rejects, none of them gets anything. And if she, she accepts, they get they, according to what the proposer determined. Um, so this, this, is, this, is, this game, which the rational game theory uh, solution suggests that the proposer should just give the one cent to the responder, and the responder is if rational, should accept it because one cent is better than, than zero, um, uh, is, um, has been the main tool to study fairness in, in many of these systems. But in practice, um, a human has a sense of fairness, so most of the people in the experiment have re reject any offer that is below 30 to 50, uh, 25 to 40% of, of the original, original resource. So, um, and as I said, this is, this, this, this is, this is not only uh, important in, in, in the social cases, but also in the interaction of, of uh, the, the, the bi-directional interaction of um, uh, human agents and, and autonomous agents. Um, um, so, and uh, um, slide 29, we have studied this and uh, we, uh, we figured out that uh, the network skewness and modularity again the good the our friend modularity are two determinant factors of 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 uh, the level of fairness that emerge in the in in these systems so i'll uh, leave the rest of the slides for your reference to uh, to look and let me if there is any question just we'll uh, go to slide thirty five which is uh, are the three takeaways of, of the talk. One, uh, the, the first takeaway is that the uh, design of connectivity structure is a 
uh, is an important mechanism to um, to get the desired behavior out of social technical systems, and the desired behavior is all uh, the resource the, the resource allocation, the dynamic resource allocation under uncertainty, as we saw for the case of efficient uh, network or the overall uh, uh, group behavior, and when it comes to uh, issues such as fairness or or uh, cooperation or competition. Um, um, there are also several interesting research uh, uh, projects or research questions that bridge the gap between uh, network science and engineering of um, social technical systems. And uh, I, I think our community can, can um, say a lot in, in, in that domain, so I encourage all my academic colleagues to uh, possibly pay more attention to this uh, fact. And, uh, and also uh, going to slide 36 and um, some, some uh, research themes, um, some references on slide uh, 37 uh, with some links for, to, to, to the papers uh, from our groups. And finally, uh, the, the last slide is uh, upcoming topics that of, of um, three or four wonderful speakers that will uh, present in 2016. So uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So I'll stop here. I will be happy to respond to any questions. Uh, this is uh, John Poirier. I do have a question. It looks like a lot of the representations are static uh, points in time, and I didn't really, maybe it was said, but I didn't walk away with any uh, insight as to transition mechanisms uh, in terms of the states of connectivity. In other words, what's the intensity of a connection at a given point in time? How does that change over time? And how does that stimulate those benefits at the second, third, fourth order level? Uh, were you able to look into that at all? Does that question make sense, um, first yes. of all? Yes, very good question. So okay. let me, um, if we look at the light, uh, so uh, there are there are two, two, two ways to, to look at this. One is to, if we have any, um, if we don't have any um, intuition about the future of uncertainty, so we have, uh, the, we designed the system for the maximum level of uncertainty and we want to fix the, um, uh, fix this structure, we go with the notion of efficiency as we discussed. If we go, if you want to allow uh, evolving the structure, then that's where we look at, um, so let me see where, where the slide 20, slide 23, for example, where um, depending on, um, depending on the uh, uh, changes in the environment, nodes uh, connect or uh, remove their connections to to each other, and that results in, for example, for the high level of uh, complex, complexity in the environment, results in more modular uh, structuring the network. So this example is actually an evolving, evolving structure. Another aspect of uh, time evolution is the evolution of um, is the evolution of um, um, uh, agents' behavior, and that's where the the framework on uh, life 25 and some of the examples that that was presented in the in the context of by combining um, um, evolutionary game theory or, or or learning agents with with networks can help. So uh, yes, the short answer is yes. We have both looked into the evolving structure and also evolving behavior over time. But of course, uh, we have um, several simplifying assumptions that we need to address in the for for uh, for the next stages of the research. All right. Thank you. So, Doc, I don't know if 
you notice uh, Daniel Pell's question in the chat? Uh, I didn't, so let me see. Uh, oh, chat is so small, so let me see. Uh, I can ask it over voice if you can hear me now. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, my question is, as the complexity, especially with the interactions and density of networks goes up, do you think that stochastic agent-based modeling is really going to be the primary or only method of understanding complex social te technical networks, basically as we kind of move from binary relationships to fuzzy social network analysis, then eventually in specific modeled instances where there's a probability distribution and even the fundamental design structure matrix can be changed uh, because some of the adaptive decision-making agents will, um, I guess, depending on random or at least stochastic events, change those relationships. Do you think uh, the ABM uh, with stochastic modeling approach is about the only one that works? Are there others that you think would work or make sense? Uh, depends, um, that, that depends. On, on the level of complexity that you want to, you want you need in your model. So um, your your system might be uh, very complex, but for for the purpose for some some for some purposes, you don't need to to bring in all those those complexity into your model. So in those cases, there are two um, two um, uh, occasions where you probably can you can you can do away with with agent based modeling. One is the low level of heterogeneity, even even if you have some sort of uh, your strategic interaction, in some cases you can have, go with with an analytical solutions, and analytical solutions can give you some heuristics for this for design of uh, of the structure of these social technical systems. If they don't give you the exact solutions, I don't think even agent based simulation, unless we are talking about 10 years from now will give us exact solutions, but they will give us like some 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 uh, uh, heuristics founded in 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 uh, grounded in theory. So that's that's one case. The other case is where you do not have bidirectional interaction among the making agents. So if you are if some of the decisions of some of the units are 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 fixed or or controlled rather than rather than autonomous. In that case, as you can think of those set of agents as, as um, exogenous variables to your, to your model and, and uh, again, go to uh, go for simpler models. But if you want to bring in bidirectional um, interactions and also higher, higher levels of heterogeneity, yes, we need some kind of multi-agent solutions or agent-based simulations, but again, I will just like to tell, put this in like in practice, is that the way that we use agent-based simulation today is very is very uh, immature. So we'd like the, the whole field of agent-based simulation needs to become much richer and more rigorous to, to be able to address some of these cases that you just mentioned. Okay, and then would you argue that well, at least be willing to accept an argument that kind of the right track would be to take some of those vetted uh, analytic solutions as a limited set of heuristics to then take forward into agent-based modeling and maybe use that as a means of actually having kind of validated modeling and simulation, or is that still really not a complete enough approach? Uh, I, I, I think I think you summarized it very well. So this is this is um, if you. If we define agent-based simulation in, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, yes, that's 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 a good way to start. Uh, I'll, I, I would start with, with simplifying assumptions, go with some analytical solutions, start do some find some heuristics, and then build your, your and start gradually start adding complexity to to the systems to the and the, I think the 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 one one uh, guiding principle is to do everything, to do everything that you can do analytically, and then after, you, if you want to go with simulation models, you have got to be sure that uh, simulation model is sim simulation method is agent-based simulation method is is the right way to go. But yes, yeah, so your summary was was uh, was correct. 
Thanks. All right. Um, before I forget, uh, Babak, I'd like to thank you very much for being, of course, our, our first presenter at the CERT Talks. We are uh, past uh, 2 o'clock, which is the uh, scheduled time for the WebEx 10, but I know folks may still have questions. Um, if there's nothing immediate, uh, you know, we will, of course, people, I know people have jumped out already. Babak, I don't know how much time you have to hang on the line if there are any other questions. I don't see any others coming in through the chat window. Uh, but I want to also uh, remind them, we, go ahead, Babak, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, like anyone, feel free to, to um, um, send me an email. I'll be happy to discuss any parts of the uh, present, this is this, uh, any part of the presentation that was of interest to you uh, offline. And, but here I, I can uh, I'll answer to another couple of questions before I go to. Excellent. And I just want to remind everybody that our next uh, CERC talk is going to be August 3rd by Dr. Dinesh Verma, again from Stevens Institute. And uh, the issue he'll be addressing is what were the top issues and opportunities from the CERC Model Centric Design and Acquisition Forum. So, <laughs> so do we have any other questions for Dr. Hedari before we close out for today? All right, I don't see any more questions coming in. So again, thank you very much all for attending. Dr. Hedari, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, and again, we much appreciate it. Thank you, thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too.